Dog is on one tonight. Two, Two one. <laughs> one. And we're live. Coming at you again, Blue Collar Green Pockets. Tonight we are going to talk about the wonderful world of culinary. We've got three excellent people on here tonight. We've got Chef Charles. Uh, he goes by Bubba. He's coming at us from uh, Disney World, which, in the, uh, from what I gather, is a great place to land if you're in the culinary uh, world. We've got Philip Epstein, no relation to the guy that did not kill himself. He is coming at us from the Great Goose in Hampton, Virginia. Him and his wife have owned the, they bought out the Great Goose 13 years ago, which is a 38 year old establishment. And he is quite the baker. And then coming at us from Chesapeake, Virginia, Virginia Bees, Chesapeake, and Suffolk, Mike Tui with the Egg Bistro. They have three locations getting ready to open their fourth uh, destination to be announced. Um, guys, uh, welcome to the show. We appreciate you having here. Um, what we want to uh, talk about tonight basically is how y'all get into your career, uh, your passion, and, um, uh, you know, Every, every week we get on here, we talk about everyone takes a school, whatever. They, they pick a profession, but then there's multiple avenues they can go. And the cool thing tonight is every one of y'all went a different path in your own you know, restaurant world. So we want to get right into that. We're going to try to keep the show to an hour. As always, we've got Guru Dave Jones and inspirational Chuck Wilson. Um, I'm going to start right out, and we're just going to go right to Mickey Mouse. Um, <laughs> Charles, Baba, talk to me. Uh, what got you into the uh, culinary, and how did you land at Disney? Well, kind of a funny story. I was at the uh, University of Delaware, uh, working, being a doctor, and uh, we came on a trip down here to Disney World, and I found out they had a culinary apprenticeship, and uh, my parents were extremely excited that they had paid for four years of college, and that now I wanted to move to Florida and cook for $5.26 an hour as an apprentice. But ended up down here and uh, been here since 93, and I love it. Great so place. real quick, I'm going to get more into that, but I just want to get back to the fact that you started at $5.26 an hour, and now yep. you're an executive chef at Disney, right? Yeah, I'm uh, responsible entirely for one food court and then partially for uh, 11 other hotels, each about 20 to $25 million in business. So about two hundred and fifty million in business. That's incredible numbers. Big wow. corporate. <laughs> um, so that's how you got in. So Mike, Mike Tui, uh, real yes, quick, sir. how how did you get into uh, the restaurant world? Uh, I think I always had a passion for it as a kid, and then my parents' friends owned a restaurant down the street when I was growing up, and we were allowed to start working at thirteen. So the day after I turned 13, I got a work permit, and that was it. <laughs> it's funny you said much. that. My son is 13 now, and I just put him on payroll this week. So yeah. that, that's great. 13 is the is the age. So then what happened started from there? As, started as a bus boy for three fifty an hour, plus tips. <laughs> and then uh, worked my way into the kitchen, was running the kitchen by the time I was 19, I think. Stayed in the kitchen for a few years. Okay. How many restaurants did you bounce around? Um, before mine? Yes, before yours. Three. Three okay. different businesses, that's it. So, Hammerhead's down at the beach, and then uh, I worked for corporate Hooters for a little while, which was draining. But, the, per cool. but the perks were great. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Did y'all have them rotate the ice frequently? Did you notice that Jeb's truck is painted the same colors as Hooters? Where do you think I met Mike? Where do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Philip, uh, same question to you, my man. How did you get into the the baking world that you're in? I actually started with a, an apprenticeship program at the Trellis um, back in, I want to say, 82 or so, and um, decided that's what I wanted to do. And I left, I left before my apprenticeship program was up, but... Um, still stayed in the baking field and a couple of years down the road I decided I needed to learn what I was doing and went to Johnson and Wales in Providence Rhode Island and um, that's where I learned what I do um, ever since then I've been hopping around just 
anywhere I can go to learn a new technique or um, gain some knowledge. And uh, I was ended up at Colonial Williamsburg for 15 years, um, ended up there as their head baker um, for a while. And uh, then my wife and I moved to Hampton and bought a restaurant. Hey, hey Philip, I got a question for you on that. Yes, sir. Stop you. Because I hear this all the time. When I, when I think of, sh I'm a refrigeration guy, so I've been in a lot of restaurants, right? Like Jeb, I mean, or, or, we don't go in the front door. You know, we're used to walking in the back door of buildings and, you and sliding, I both. sliding our way in the kitchen there, whatever's going on, depending on what kitchen it is. But when you talk about baking, like I always think about a chef being a chef, but there, there's definitely a, a a demising wall between a baker and a chef like a like are, can you still go yes. cook a meatloaf or are you just cooking a cake? <laughs> yeah. the funny part about that is that yes i can make a meatloaf but they can't make a cake okay they, it's, it's right. really it's really hard to uh to train a a person that's been cooking to be a baker are you more yeah. artsy are you guys more artsy is yeah. that why we do, we do some neat stuff we've done a lot of sculpted cakes and different wedding cakes um but it, there's not as much demand for that um because of the, the cost you know everybody sees you know um what's his name out of new, new york um the cake uh, master cake boss or whatever cake boss. Is. they see cake boss they see all that neat stuff but then when you tell them it's going to cost them three thousand dollars you know they're like holy moses no yeah so they, they, <laughs> they, they want the 30 they want the 30 dollar version so in your in your operation you would just concentrate on desserts then pretty much right and bread yeah, i do breads and desserts and, and pastries for the restaurant you are like the anti-keto guy <laughs> you are uh, like well, <laughs> yeah you don't know anybody baker. on a keto diet yeah but this guy's yeah, a baker know. he's slim he, i mean you are slim well i lost i, I just read last year i've lost 110 pounds congratulations wow. yeah so and you it's quit crazy. trying the product right <laughs> the funny part is it's like what is your favorite cake and i'm like i really don't have one as far yeah. as i'm concerned they're all cake good. Is barrier for ice cream my favorite thing is ice cream okay. so okay i like cake but i like ice cream with my cake so i see a lot of heads shaking yes out there in the audience <laughs> by the way no, nobody has a mask on here tonight my my daughter has watched every episode and nailed it that's her jam she wants to be uh, a baker like we're we're, we're, hip. we're hip to the bake world. So Philip says that, okay? Bubba, could you bake if you had to? Uh, I know. The, um, I've worked at a couple of the bakeries at the, the Grand Floridian, the Contemporary, and the Polynesian. So I know enough I could get by, but um, definitely not a pastry chef. So it's definitely a different thing. Say, you would say the same thing, yeah. Mike? It's Mike, do you make anything perfect. other than brownies? <laughs> brownies. <laughs> We don't, we, don't do, we don't do much desserts anymore since we closed at night. I don't think he was talking about desserts. Hey, Mike knows what I'm talking about. I know what brownies are talking about. Right. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Mike, Mike did a lot of catering, and I've actually had some of their Oreo brownie cakey thingies. They were pretty good. That was probably out of a box, Mike. No? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Phil, hey, Philip, I just think th – thanks for your answer. I think that's very interesting because, like, in – I always equate everything back to refrigeration and air conditioning. All right. And we, we dabble in some other stuff occasionally, this and that, but, but we might not be great at it because we don't do it every day. And in right. and, and every industry, I think there's different segments of every industry that makes it is like I say, the fingers that go out and you can get these specialty things. And I just think that bakery thing is something that people take for granted and they don't understand. That's a, that's a, that's a skill within itself. Do you actually measure? It's more scientific, you know, you, you can't be throwing a handful of this and a handful of that in. It's actually a measurement. Uh, my, I've got my recipes broken down into all into percentages. So um, I can make the smallest amount to the largest amount, but it's a specific amount. Okay. You know? And so when people give me a recipe that has cups in it, I just like roll my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Amateur hour. <laughs> Amateur hour. <laughs> what are they making cake for? One? <laughs> and how, and how many servings is this? <laughs> no, all my recipes started out like that, but I converted them. So it's, but I, I convert all my recipes into pounds and percentages. So, cause it makes my life easier. 
and and let's get back to Chef Bubba on this one. We're talking about feeding a lot of people. Yeah, uh, Bubba, talk to us. I mean, you're feeding how many people a day? Uh, oh my goodness, of three thousand. See, I'll just uh, add ingredients by the trash can barrel, or no? Wait a minute, wait a out of those three thousand, though, how many are a turkey leg? That's what I want to know. <laughs> oh, in the park. Uh, so yeah. I worked in the park. If you're in the park, they serve uh, about fifteen hundred to two thousand pounds of turkey legs a day. Oh, oh, Jesus. Hey, amazing. hey, and you're add another five hundred pounds when Dave's at, at the, the park. park. <laughs> Don't even start. You need to stand up. But listen, listen. What amazes me is you have your kid in there, and I've seen it happen. And the kid drops his turkey leg on the ground, and they're out there saying, "Here, here's another turkey leg." Yep. The question. It's all about. It's all about the turkey leg. Down. Go ahead, Bubba. How much? So you're three thousand, three thousand people a day. You guys are serving. Uh, and 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 the one food court in the one resort, yes, we do about three thousand people. Um, we have about four thousand that stay in each of the. We have, oh my goodness, uh, around forty, fifty thousand between the eleven moderate and value resorts. So that's the All Stars, Art of Animation, um, Pop Century, Port Orleans, the new Coronado Tower. Um, all those resorts. Wow. Well, uh, uh, and Baba, so that that's going to take a lot of uh, labor to you know oh. put together. So where where are y'all finding your your young new employees? How are y'all? How are you getting them? Um, well, we have a very active recruiting uh, department. Um, we call it casting because at, at Disney, you're a cast member. You're not an employee. Um, you, you, you play a role in the, a part in the show, so you're a cast member. And we have a casting department with three senior casting people and then five people that report to them that look for people for us. They use Indeed, they use culinary schools, um, anything. Uh, we'll take a, the lowest uh, in our kitchen as a cook, too. Um, We'll basically take someone with zero cooking experience. I can teach them to cook if they want to learn, but they, they have to want to learn. But I'll bring them in if they've never cooked before, if they want to learn. And are y'all the, so the best way sometimes? Bottom dishwasher all the way up to a chef assistant. Um, is there, is there chef. Bubba, is there anybody there, and I'm sure there is, that came on, you know, wet behind the ears, just a greenhorn, that's still there, and you've seen them rise up in the ranks. Uh, yeah, uh, one of my sous chefs right now, um, she came in as a cook too. I got her up to a chef assistant, which is the highest hourly level when we were in the castle. And she, we went our separate ways, but we've kept in touch. I've been a mentor, and now she's back as a salaried leader for me. Well, that's so, awesome. Absolutely. A lot of people like that. I have about twenty or thirty people I've done Mike, that with. Mike, do you see that in your in your business too? Like people that you bring in, you got any like greenhorns you brought in? I mean, you've been around the restaurant industry around town there for a while. It sounds like. Yes. So typically, as long as they pay attention, that works out the best for us. People that want to learn, people that aren't bringing ideas or bad habits from other places mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it, and then. We also see people coming back. We're chefs and we're high end restaurants and stuff like that. They want to kind of slow down, just produce food, which is kind of mm -hmm. what we do. There's not a lot of room for creativity, and that's all handled by me and a couple other people. So it's just a production line. Really. They're just knocking it out. They're just knocking, knocking it out. out. So, are you dinner? Are you three meals or what are you, three meals or not? Uh, we were, we started as two meals, went to three meals after uh, the first year. And we did that for, God, eight, nine years and decided to cut the dinner back out and go back to our roots where we started. It was just too much. You're really good at what you do, and then somebody else can do the dinner then. Yeah, it's, it's just. That's three minutes. Getting going. up early, that, closing that could late. Be, that could be getting at five in the morning, getting home at two in the morning kind of thing. So, oh, that yeah. place I asked you about was Lynn Haven Inn. That's what it is. My, Lynn Haven Fish House. Lynn, Lynn Haven Fish House, yeah. Terry's right. much older than he was when he was running three <laughs> three meals. At, uh, they, just, uh, they just shut it down. 
I believe. Mm. Philip, um, you know, you've got the, the bacon thing. So yours is, you know, you got that science, that exact measurements. What are y'all doing to find new people in your industry, per se, just <clears throat> the baking side of the food industry? Well, right now, we're just chomping at the bit to get our employees back. Where it's been since this COVID thing, it's been my wife and uh, myself and one manager and uh, my brother-in-law helping out. So that's it. We've gone from 15 to 20 employees to four. Yeah, will you have that? Are you are you setting it up to have that team come back when we get oh, through this? Definitely. Yeah, okay. definitely. We're in constant communication with our employees. Um, but, you know, it's a, um, we're, we're hoping to get everybody back. But uh, unfortunately, with the, the help from the government, some of them are getting paid more, more by the government. Mm-hmm. And so then you're really going <laughs> to. So everyone's, gonna... everyone's just shaking. Like, uh... like, you know, oh, yeah, but I can make more from unemployment. It's kind of scary. Yeah, so, that's, 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 that's scary. That's going to July 31st, back. I think. That's a little bit. That's a little bit backwards. That's a little bit backwards. There, it sounds like. It, it really is. It really is. So, but you know, we're gonna we're gonna work on it. If they're if they're ready to come back when we're ready when we need them, then that's great. But you know what? You know what I just saw? I saw a look on Chuck's face like he had a question for you. <laughs> he gets a certain look on his face. Are we on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, thinking about how much. Uh, it, Hopefully everybody will be returning to uh, uh, restaurants and so on. But I'm thinking about how much food presentation has changed over the years. I mean, it used to be uh, uh, you'd go and it's like, all right, all these, all the food is just jammed on the plate. Right. Now, I mean, it's it's uh, the whole experience is so much different. It's a big part okay. of the competition, okay. I think, to. Uh, not just have it slopped on there, but uh, uh, right. to, to have uh, uh, a customer experience something special, you know, uh, with the meal. I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Chef Philip. Uh, how is that? How have you seen that evolve? Well, you know, I you know, I, I you said slop it on the plate, and I think of Thanksgiving dinner. You know, the way everybody <laughs> like, loads up that plate. It does. My dad <laughs> used to have a pile on his plate that you couldn't see an inch of plate. And so, but we have tried to change that way. You know, we're trying to make the plate look as, as because you eat with your eyes first. So we want the plate to look good as well as taste good. So I, I, I think, you know, some restaurants as they go down the road, they tend to lose that sight. And so things start to slip. And I think we've tried to bring the Grey Goose into the 21st century with more modern foods, um, different little flair here and there from my wife. So um, I think I think it's definitely a, an important part of it. How about you, uh, Chef Bubba? How how does Disney uh, deal with presentation? It's it's changed a lot. Um, when when I got there, um, I worked at the Liberty Tree Tavern in the Magic Kingdom, and we served everything was French style, which I don't know why, <laughs> tavern, but I, I, the theming was all. <laughs> you didn't now. argue, though. <laughs> well, no, I was an apprentice. I did exactly what I was told, and that's how I got the bubba was from my apprenticeship. Um, and and we did kind of sort of put it on the plate. It wasn't real fancy. And the uh mid mid to late 90s um we got some chefs from that had been at la cirque and some of the places in new york thomas keller the he some of those people and they came in and they opened the california grill on top of the contemporary and it changed everything it became all about the flavor the presentation um we cut the number of seats in restaurants back, believe it or not, and because we could charge a little more because the food was so much better. I remember you hooking me up in there when I was yep. with the kids at Fort Wilderness many years ago in that place. Yep. Up, and you came up and saw us up there. I remember that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. Nice place. So even Disney's into that presentation thing, it sounds like. Yep. Yeah, the, 
it's a criteria now. You have to have a tasting with your culinary director before it can go on the menu. Uh, Mike, uh, Chef Mike, uh, how how much attention do you give to the presentation? Sound like uh, you do that and you know, kind of uh, set the format for your folks? So we're a little bit of a mixture of both, I guess. We're known for having big portions and having the plate full, but I've also changed a lot of menu items and come up with new menu items that are you know, visually appealing and uh, a little bit more artistic than just slopping stuff on the plate. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the country, the country breakfasts, like the good stick your rib meals, are still people want to see biscuits and gravy and gravy <laughs> sopping off the plate. And, right. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it's winter time and raining and. It, it, it changes more in the summertime when people lighten up with what they're eating. Also. Mike, Mike, if you want something to eat, what do you I always wonder, like a guy that's a chef, like, what do you eat? It's like somebody that cuts hair all day long. Who cuts their hair? Like, if you want something to eat, like, what do you get? I bring in leftover dinner from the night before okay, and heat right. it up at six in the morning. You like the leftovers Pizza, of- whatever I make the night before. Tomorrow will be Chinese food tomorrow morning. So, Philip, if you had a meal and you wanted to take your wife out somewhere and get a good meal, I mean, what do you what do you go for? What kind of food? Um, I, I, well, I love sushi, but she's not a big fan of it. So um, we usually go to an American um, style restaurants. Um, our favorite one is in Williamsburg. Um, the name? <laughs> Bonds. We, we like Waypoint. That's our favorite. My, uh, my old friend Hans Schadler owns it from Cloning Williamsburg. Um, great guy, great chef, um, and it's just really good food. It's not cheap, but it's really good. So, and so um, I like kind of like that, you know, something that's really good, and you don't have to eat a lot of it to feel satisfied. Philip, so 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 those watching right now, so we got some kids. They're like, okay, right now they get three three choices they could go right now, right? They say they want to maybe go to culinary school or whatever. If they wanted to be Chef Philip Einstein, yeah. <laughs> Epstein, <laughs> Epstein, <laughs> Epstein, <laughs> Einstein, and uh, you if have they, to if, get him on a non-drinking day. Oh, right. come on now! If they want to be <laughs> Chef Philip, I, good luck, <laughs> Epstein. Uh, what do they got? What do they got to do right now if they want to be you? Tell them what they what, tell them what they need to do. I can barely hear you. Your you audio is gone. Yeah, uh, we. I was told it was too loud so we, we turn it down a bit um if a kid wants perfect that's good someone that's wants good. to be chef philip einstein what, what's the path they want to we're talking to 10th grader 10th grader 10th grader. grader hooked on phonics <laughs> up here look y'all said it i had to go with it so if they if they want to be you what what's the easiest path they're going to take um the easy the, the easiest way is to start in if your high school offers that kind of class cooking classes baking classes, you know, restaurant type of classes, take them um, and then get a job in a, a restaurant um, before you spend a lot of money on a rest uh, on a culinary school. I think experience goes a long way. I think um, you're, you're better off getting a little bit of experience and finding out, is this really what I want to do? And then uh, go from there. If that's what you want to do after three or five years, and go to school, learn what you're doing. Spend the money. I've now, seen a lot yeah. of people spend the money. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. You're next. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, Mike. I've seen a lot of people spend that money and go to culinary school and spend about a year in the kitchen and haul ass out of there. Oh, yeah. They just couldn't take it. A lot right. of people. Yeah, well, yeah, when you start telling them you're working 18 hours or you're working weekends and holidays and birthdays, and they're like, what? You know, so I can't have the weekend off. So why do you do it? So why do you do it? I, I love to bake. I love right. my, my, my passion is bread. I love bread. I love all kinds of bread. Um, I can't eat it now, but I still love to make it. So um, I just, I enjoy it. It's very peaceful. Except for when my boss says she needs it yesterday. <laughs> so, so two of you had chimed in. I mean, what, what's, what's your take on how to be two On how to be two Yeah, how you be two Shit, I don't know. Blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> I mean, the short route. You went. You went around the. You went all the way around. Like, give me the direct path. Uh, mine was just 
the desire to learn everything I could about the restaurant business. So I did a couple different uh, versions, nightclubs, DJing, bartending. You know, got out of the restaurant business cooking for a little while. Got into the bar business by cooking, but so what, got myself out of the kitchen for a while. So what would you tell then, somebody right now? What to do? Right now? Yeah, you're... Run. <laughs> <laughs> nah, the guy that you're I'm... trying to hire next week, what are you going to tell him? What's the path? It's, it's sink or swim from in our, the way I look at it. So you, you, you either have the knack for it or you don't. You have the drive for it or you don't. What about passion? You got to have passion, right? The passion, yeah. I mean, isn't that true? We always talk about that every week, right, Chuck? We yeah. sure do. That's it's our... the one common denominator we're, through we're... all these things. I know, like, Bubba's got a passion. He went down there. He had a passion for this, you well, know? Bubba's going to tell us how to be a Disney uh, premier chef right now. Go ahead, Bubba. How to be me? Yeah, how to be you. <laughs> um, find me down some Scrapple, Delaware made, <laughs> only, and some Nicobolis. <laughs> well, they're closed now. They're closed for COVID today. They closed. Uh, um, no, I, I would agree. It's it's all willingness to learn, uh, be open-minded, um, swallow your pride, keep your mouth shut, your eyes open, and do what you're told and learn. But be passionate about it, and I would I would agree that if get a job, try it out before you spend all that money, or if you could find an apprenticeship, do an apprenticeship. That was the yeah. best thing I ever did in my life was right. learning while I was doing it. Do you still keep in touch with any of those like mentors you had when you were just getting in? I mean, Absolutely. Uh, they they're all still my leaders now. They're vice presidents and senior vice presidents. I just haven't called up to them yet. Someday. Just, but they've been dragging <laughs> you along. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've stayed with a lot of the people and I'm friends with, uh, I don't even know how many now, still, from from my first day. Uh, the lady that gave me the name Bubba, she is in charge of the Food and Wine Festival at Epcot. She's in charge of all the, um, the guest chefs that come. She's the one that brings them all down. So she, she's still, she's not in the kitchen kitchen, but She's still at Disney. Yep. I keep in touch with everyone. It's all about connections. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, right? You've mentioned, yeah. uh, I think a few of you mentioned uh, to give uh, give it a shot and see whether you uh, like it or not before you go spend a lot of money on whatever school. Uh, and, and our observation, or one of the things that we've discussed a lot on the show, is so many folks that uh, end up going into college without any direction, without any passion for what they are studying. Uh, and we're just uh, trying to help folks see other options that they might have a passion for before they head into their uh, uh, education uh, stream. Do you, you see a, uh, many uh, uh, folks that spent some time uh, in college and and were kind of lost there before they found their way in the, the culinary arts? We do. Um, we get a lot of them um, that were in school. Um, I, mean, I was in school to be a doctor, ended up as a <laughs> chef. It was kind of crazy. So so how many how many years were you in school before you made that uh, leap? Four. Four years. Yeah, how much did that you, cost you? It cost him a dime. <laughs> no, 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 for the, for the, for the doctor part. Uh, that was, uh, mom and dad were good enough to do that. That's why Fair when enough. I started here, it was not the, uh. Full disclosure, I know his mom and dad, so, so I was able yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they weren't thrilled to death about the move down here, but now they're, uh, very proud of you. And then you said, uh, Disney put you through, uh, the apprenticeship of the schooling there at Disney, right? Yeah, uh, the first three years I worked at Disney were an apprenticeship, and there there's so many places to work. But what in the the first year was Magic Kingdom, and I worked in a different restaurant every three months. So by the time you had figured out the restaurant and how to work the line and how to cook the food, then you had to pick up and go to another place. My second year was at the Grand Floridian. I worked all around the Grand Floridian worked as the butcher, the saucier, all the traditional stuff. 
um, then went to the Polynesian after that, did the same there. Um, so I worked in um, 12 different restaurants plus butcher shop, saucier, um, everything in three years. So I'd worked in 12 restaurants in three years and kept my head above water somehow. <laughs> I mean, where could you get, where could, that, let me ask you something, Bubba. You, you could have, could you have done that without going to college? To, um, did anybody do it without going to college? I, I have some friends. Now, what they did is is they go and they do a, a stage, and, and you go and say uh, Eleven Madison Park in, in New York, and you go, but you work for free. Mm -hmm. You go there and you work a couple months for free. Um, like I can't afford to do this, make money. Um, but I do know people that have done that as well. And some of them will even leave for a little while and go do that. You know, we'll give them like a, a couple months off and they'll go work somewhere like a French laundry or, a, mm. you know, one of those places. But, um, yeah, you can do that, but not so much as an apprentice. Um, that, that, that's hard to get now. That's hard to find now with things because it's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Anybody get a little like, feedback there? Yeah, no, go ahead, Philip. No, what are you saying, Philip? Good say culinary is like the new navy. You know, you know, join culinary and see the world. I mean, you can go anywhere you want. I mean, they need cooks, they need bakers, pastry people everywhere. You know, you. I've I've lived in a lot of different places, and you can, you know, you can go anywhere and get a job as a cook or as a chef. You just have to be the where have the wherewithal and the knowledge to do it, and the willingness to. What is the, uh, there's a high stress level that often gets advertised via the TV. You know, you have shows like Hell's Kitchen and you got Hell on Wheels. Somebody's and, got some background music there. <laughs> um, I don't know about the background music, but you, you have these shows that, do they portray the right image of what a kitchen is like? Or are they, I, I'm just thinking of the ways that, what people see on the TV can impact what their overall image of culinary is and what they, what their expectations should be getting into the field. How long, I mean, every job is going to be tough and you've got to kind of buckle down and show a bit of character and show drive to get through it. But how do you, how do you properly illustrate what it's really like to folks? That's tough. Oh, the first thing I would say is most of the TV shows are uh, the reason that people get into this field for the wrong reason. Um, yeah. It's you, you, There's never a day you're going to get three hours to make one plate. If, if that day <laughs> happens, I would love to see it. That would be awesome. Right. Um, have three hours to make 400 plates. You know, and I don't think they really portray that. Now, in a fine dining restaurant, it is a little bit like Hell's Kitchen, and the expediter will stand there and tell you your food sucks and go make it again and may or may not throw a pan at you. Um, <laughs> in this day and age, not as many pans being thrown. But in fine dining, that, that does happen like that. And the kitchens are dead quiet. No one's talking but the chef. Really? For, qual for like, quality? You mean... He's actually the captain of the ship then. Yep. The expediter really is the captain of the ship. Whoever's putting the orders together and getting them together to go out to the dining room runs the kitchen. You know what I noticed has changed over over the years is um is this open kitchen concept. It's like when I travel, I, I always think of this one place in Chicago called the Purple Pig. And you go to this place, Purple Pig, and this this guy's parents, he's a second generation guy and his parents had an amazing place. And he left them when he was younger and went to New York to become a really, really good chef and came back. I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but it's totally an open kitchen in there. And you go in there and you sit there. And when I'm in Chicago, like if I'm in Chicago, I go there, went there twice the last time I was there in the same day. And, and, and you sit at the counter and you watch this open kitchen thing. And it's like, I know is from being a refrigeration guy, what's going on back in these kitchens. I've been back in these kitchens. That open kitchen stuff is a whole nother, that's like bearing your soul back there. Yes, I mean, it is. What's the attraction of that? And, and, and why has that become so popular? Because uh, you can see your food being made. 
Okay. Um, I went to Brazil um, and went and had uh, dinner at Dom in Sao Paulo. And it's one of the top three restaurants in the world. And they had an open kitchen. And the, the chef himself came out to the table and explained every single dish, each, each of 11 courses. Um, but they want you to see the food being made and how it's prepared and the detail and the, and the uh, focus of the people working on it. Those open kitchens are very, very popular now. I see them all over. Philip, is, your, is yours like that? Like, have you ever done anything like that? The new restaurant will be. Um, the Great Goose is closed off to a certain extent. But the, um, the baker's wife, when we open that restaurant up, um, it's going to be a, a open kitchen concept. So with serving French, uh, French American cuisine. I just think that, Sounds what do great. you think about that, Mike? What, how's that going your theme? So we actually have partially open kitchens and uh, the one in Suffolk, the kitchen's basically fully open. Um, you can see and the, the customers love it. Yeah, I think it's But neat. at the same it's time, it's kind of interactive. <laughs> they have to be hyper, hyper sensitive and know exactly what they're doing at all times because one, one mistake can really throw somebody off. I'll tell you what, the ones I've been in, like that Purple Pig in Chicago, I recommend it if you haven't been there. It's like choreographed watching these people. They're not even talking to each other. Nope. I mean, this yeah. guy knows what's going on. This guy, and I know some in Florida the same way. They, they, they're, they're just like, you go and order your uh, encrusted grouper or whatever it is, and you sit there and you watch them make this thing, and, and it's choreographed. It's like, it's amazing to me. These people must work together all the time because they're, it's not like – Somebody's usually like, there's one guy like barking out something every once in a while, but there's nobody standing there going, you do this, you do that, you do this. Everybody's kind of got their own own job, it seems like. It's all yeah. timing. Yeah. It has it's to do time with time. You know, huh. certain things have to come out at a certain time, and usually the guy that's doing the expediting is the one telling you when to start it. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's the conductor or when she. I, when I think about the hours that – these places, some of these places are open, like a good old place. It might be open like five to 10. But in that five to 10, in that five hours, the way these guys are working, <laughs> it's like working 24 hours. I mean, and by the way, the only score is a thousand. Unless you're batting a thousand, the nights have failed, okay? Because every different person, every different taste, every different dish, every different temperature, you know, is a scorecard. Is a scorecard. You guys, you guys live on a, you know, a, a, a good batter in baseball. You know, could hit 350 and make it to the Hall of Fame. Good refrigeration guy could fix 80 percent of his stuff. And get pretty <laughs> hey, 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 Mike, right. Mike, coming in. Um, this goes for anybody. So let's say, especially even at Disney. So let's say a media, somebody's been there, say five, ten years, and then somebody's just like, uh, let's just say, a manager of a store. I mean, money wise, what could Ballparks, we're not going to get anybody in trouble with their employees here or uh, co-workers. Ballpark-wise, let's give the people at home just a little idea of coming up the ranks. You know, you start out, Mike, you said you started at 526 an hour or whatever. Or, I'm sorry, Chef Bubba did. Coming up the ranks, I mean, uh, money-wise, I mean, what can you expect 5, 10, 20 years into the field? Now, well, mind you, this is somebody that kicks ass. Not like your normal guy that's just happy cutting onions. The guy that wants to come up. <laughs> How much can you make? Yeah, Did starting. Yeah, starting out. Sky's the limit, right? But in 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 the in interval, like say from a junior chef, intermediate, and then like running a kitchen at Disney per se, and then we'll get the other ones. Well, uh, hourly wise, almost everyone uh, the big companies in Orlando have all gone to a minimum of fifteen dollars to start. The start. Uh, Good money. Yep. It's great money to be taught how to cook. Yep. Yeah, I know. It was, five, it was a little over $5 when I started, but right. the <laughs> times are different so uh, many, many years ago. But, uh, you know, you can start out at 15, and, and really it just depends. You can go up into anywhere from the 40s, 50s to the 100s, 200s, 300s, 1,000s, just depending on, you know, your ambition and your dedication and your passion and your your work ethic and all that stuff. And again, your education was through through your employer at the time, right? Yeah. Through Disney. Yeah. 
Um, like, Chef Philip, I think you said you actually paid to go to, to a, a university. I did. I did. But, um, you know, we, we some of the people that I've hired that are the best people are the ones that haven't gone to school, you know, that have their own experience that they come with, you know, and that's, that's great. Um, because the problem with people that have gone to school, not all the time, but some of the time is that they're, they're a, a little arrogant, you know, it's like, I went to school for this. And it's, it's not the same, <laughs> you know, when you're in school, you have perfect equipment, everything. They give you the top of the line. You're not, it's not that way out in the field. I, I had a chef that says, every place you go is going to be different. You have to adapt. You have to deal with the fact that you're only one part of your scale works. The other one you have to fiddle with. So, and people get frustrated with that, you know? Um, and so sometimes the person like a guy, like, uh, those saying, um, of the egg bistro sometimes the dishwashers are the best ones to train because they don't know anything mm -hmm. you know I'm, you you, you teach them the what you teach them what you want them to do well the good thing about the egg though i can i can vouch that every single piece of their equipment is a hundred percent every piece <laughs> <laughs> that, that, sounds, that sounds a little self-serving <laughs> next next caller please self-promoting there <laughs> no but that that's very interesting go ahead terry you're you're just, adding just to speak on that i've had chefs straight out of culinary school that come work for us and we're open at night leaving in tears because they just weren't used to it with like the equipment, like you're talking about the equipment breaking down, or just sheer volume of trying right. to turn, turn tables and turn people in and out Sorry, of there. I mean, full on breakdowns. So, but if you're used to it and you got a couple of years of experience and just a basic job in the kitchen, they seem to adapt a little bit better sometimes. I think so, you yeah. have to have some really good organizational skills, you know, to get to where you guys are. How about if you're what if you're a 16 year old like when i was 16 years old this is funny but when i actually when i was 15 years old i went one of the first jobs i ever had i went to work for friendly's ice cream went to work for friendly's ice cream if any of my friends are listening they've heard this story but my first day on the job was my first taste of the restaurant business and i was in what's called the s star which is the service room the dishwashing room and i'm back in this room and my one of my jobs is to take the takeout orders from the other stores in the concord mall so they would call in their takeout orders. I answered the phone. Friendlies, can I help you? I was all excited because I actually got to answer the phone. And I answered the phone and they, this guy said, what's your soup today? And this is when I knew I wasn't gonna do any of your jobs, okay? The guy said, what's your soup today? I said, well, we have clam chowder, we have tomato, and we have mind stone. And the guy said, what do you have? And I said, we have clam chowder, we have tomato and mind stone. He said, I'll take a bowl of mind stone and a grilled cheese sandwich. So this is my first day on the job. I was so excited to put this order in. So the guy comes to pick up his takeout order from the men's store. His name was like Vince or Nicky or something like that. He had the double breasted suit on him and all that stuff that went on in the 70s. He looked like he should be on the Sopranos. He comes, he asked to see me. I go out there and he says, you ever had, have you ever had minestrone soup? And I said, I said, actually, I've never even heard of it. He said, well, that's what you just sold me. So not only could I not cook, I couldn't even read. Okay, it was minestrone, not mindstone. But, um, but I so I started like 15 years old washing dishes and stuff like that. If there's if there's a high schooler out there, you know, that likes to bake, or likes to, and you know what, the baking thing. I just wanted to say too, we talk about this every week with every profession we have. There's always a crossover, and we always say when people were like when I was young and I thought about bakers. I'm going to tell you, I thought about women, okay? But now it's a lot of, no, I just did. I just, that was a little bit. We thought about women, all right? Remember when we had nurses on here? We had a male nurse, but we said, when we thought about nurses, we thought about women. We thought about women. No, we didn't. So, so. I think Dave is just always talk, thinking about women. Well, in, your, in, your industry, in your industry, though, there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot of male bakers, right? It's a big deal, right? Uh, yeah, actually, there's there's uh, there's a lot of women bakers. There's there's probably more female bakers out there than there are males. Okay, it, it's uh it's changed around. I mean, you um, 
before when I first started, yeah, the, there was a lot of male pastry chefs and there probably still are a bunch, but um, I see more and more females coming into the field. See, I would have thought you know? the other way around. So there was always a lot of men baking. Yeah, well. <gasps> oh. no. Easy uh, fight. No, and typically, <laughs> you know, there's pastry. So typically I don't want to generalize, but a lot yeah. of ladies will go into pastry. Okay. Cake, pastry, that kind of thing. And the guys are typically <gasps> doing breads. Um, sorry, my dog's a nut ball. But uh, so, yeah, there is sort of a, a delineation there, but there's not as there, there's and I don't want to get in trouble here, but there's not as many female bakers as there are female pastry. Okay. Uh, Google, Google's got a 60 40 split women to men on on uh, bake, yeah. bake bakers, per se. Yeah, they probably right. had them on the, all in there. Which, Have you guys seen? I was gonna say which could be the the pastry like like Philip's talking. Have you guys about. seen like with that? We were talking about your weight loss, Philip, and, and you look great. Congratulations! Um, Thank you. Have you guys seen though, like in your culinary world? Because I know a lot of people have done keto, and a lot of people are cutting down their carbs and stuff. Have you guys seen that in your world? Like putting less bread out and stuff. I like, just curious. More red uh, meat, more proteins. A change in your menu carbs. per diet per se, right? Yeah. Have you seen much of that? Vegan. Yeah, we have a ton of plant-based people, um, gluten-free, keto, um, <laughs> you name it. We get it. Peanut allergies, dairy. Had somebody allergic to chicken the other day. So they said, <laughs> the body was allergic to stainless steel. So I asked the lady, I said, what are you cooking? I use aluminum. And she says, but I have an EpiPen. And I asked her if it had a bamboo needle on it. She didn't. <laughs> you can't help yourself. You can't help yourself. Right? <laughs> I mean, I just wonder if you guys see a lot of those trends. Bubba just said that he does. Well, you know, I mean, we offer a few vegan and gluten-free uh, items. Um, but, you know, I have found uh, through this whole pandemic thing, People have not stopped buying pastries. I mean, I've been selling cupcakes and pastries <laughs> like they're going out of style. They want that you know, happy so. food. They want that feel-good food. Right, right. So mm -hmm. I'm everybody's friend until they gain 10 pounds, and then I'm <laughs> Satan. I'm Satan's <laughs> Public enemy number one, right? Yeah, it's like, stay away from me. What about you, Mike? You see a lot of people saying, hold the toast, don't bring it out? Uh, yeah, there's lots of yeah, the gluten, the gluten allergies. I think a lot of it has to do more with personal preference and <laughs> wanting to try to eat healthier. But uh, lots of vegan stuff going on with us trying to do plant-based foods and trying to. We have a couple of vegan staff members that really push us to. So you have to continue to education. Items. Like you have to continue huh? update all the diets, right? You have to continue mm -hmm. to educate yourself to every trending diet that's going on, and then change your menu for those options, right? We have, yeah, we haven't. Yeah gone crazy guys, over but we've added definitely a few different items to you know bring bring the, the vegans in or whatnot well do you guys like, do much with continuing education i, I do um i'm lucky you know as, with a big company um i get uh reimbursement for education so um i'm gonna work on my mba soon and let disney pay for that and then we have all these learnings on uh, like Harvard Business School and all these little online classes you can take. They're really great. But That's there's awesome. just as many out there. Uh, Blinklist is a good app um, and it's free right now, actually. And it has a lot of good learning on it. And it's kind of like TED Talks kind of type of thing, but they're great. Hmm. Uh, do you do that, Philip? You got anything like that you continue on with? You're always looking around. I'm always looking for something that I would like to continue my education on, even though, I mean, you know, it's certain breads or, or certain pastries that I've never made that I'd like to try. Um, so I haven't had a chance because, you know, I'm basically been a one or two man band for a while. So but I'm hoping in the future to do more of it. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. What do you do to keep on top of the competition the competition? so to speak i mean everything everything is fluid 
everything is constantly changing, diets change, interests change, whatever the new fad on the TV is going to influence what people are interested in. What do you do to keep on top of that or maybe be an influence yourself, be a trendsetter? Trendsetter? And that, 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 part, that part creates the, uh, kind of incentivizes in my mind the, the creativity in the industry and then the, the pride in what you do. Because when I cook, I'm not great at it by any stretch of the imagination, but I am very prideful of what I cook. I very I enjoy feeding people, and I I I assume that everybody that's in the industry that gets into it has that same feeling. So like cake pops, who who started cake pops? You're all copying now, right? I and mean, that kind of I hate... <laughs> explain what that is. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> It's like a lollipop made out of cake on this kiss. It's a bite. I mean, hell, who's happy with a bite of cake? Like that doesn't make right. sense to me. My God, I'm a big dude. Like, what's a bite of cake? My wife looks at people like they're crazy when they're saying your cupcake has too much icing on it. She's like, "What?" <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, there's there's always the I use magazines and books. You know, uh, I I look at recipes all the time and. Um, I, I either adapt them or I, I, I come up with a variation that I like. Um, I think a lot of people, I probably have a hundred cookbooks that I don't, I never use, but, uh, I, I look at them occasionally just for <laughs> ideas, you know? Um, and that's, that's how I get a lot of my ideas. Mike tried trend setting with his haircut. I tried to follow it. I just couldn't get it to do the same thing. <laughs> so I'm with a hat. Mike, what do y'all do over the egg different? What do y'all try to what do y'all try to set the pace with over there? So we get a lot of our ideas when we travel and checking out different places and different areas of the country or whatever. Um, and then try to adapt them and change them to fit our needs. So right. a lot of the newer recipes will be variations of stuff I've seen in different parts of the country or whatever. A smart man invents and a bit. smarter man steals. Okay. Everybody no. gets. Everybody's got an idea. Some other people. What That's flavor great. ice cream are you eating? This. This is Seven Eleven's mint and cookie cream, and it's amazing. <laughs> you're killing. You're killing that. So thing. good. Whatever. Killing me. Where's the cake? I eat the cake. Uh, one thing that I'm uh, kind of infatuated with is the, the the changes in the, and we were talking a little bit about it before the open kitchen concept the you know sort of the show of uh cooking that uh restaurant uh, went to some years back uh they had a couple of tables in the kitchen that people would i don't know if you paid extra but it was competition to be able to sit at those tables and watch the uh the the cooking process and uh, or, or the train wreck but um, <laughs> but uh, it, it it's yeah. People it's, pay it's, extra for chef, the chef's table. Okay. Dave, didn't you go to V and A, the chef's table in V and A, a few times? Victoria yeah. and Al. Yeah, I did. I did. That was pretty cool. I was That's thinking about that, and then I was also thinking about this place in San Francisco. I think it was called North Shore. You ever hear of it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you would get down in the basement, and they'd have all their salamis and stuff hanging hanging from the ceiling down there and you would eat underneath them yeah. dave that hanging was, out dave hanging out in the basement eating salami <laughs> chuck that was chuck that was that was a good topic you brought up there because that's that brought me back to a number of good meals i've had in kitchens like well, that would you say it increases the professionalism um, <laughs> and expectations of the uh, the kitchen staff the, the the chefs and cooks and so on you're on display there right yeah it's a double, i think it's a double-edged sword you know it if people like to see it and they they see that you're preparing their food in a healthy way um and you know you have to be extra clean because people can see in so it, i think the employee has to be very conscious of somebody over their shoulder watching them as well as the person that's sitting in the dining room amazed at what you're throwing together 
Mm-hmm. Any open kitchen stuff down at Disney, Bubba? Yeah, um, almost all our signature restaurants are open kitchen. Some have a counter, some have chef tables. Um, there's a couple new, the new concept is instead of putting the table in the kitchen there, they're putting it right by the kitchen and you can see in the kitchen, but it's like its own separate, like a wine room where it's real nice and quiet. So you don't have all the noise to the kitchen, but you can still see it. Um, but the whole trick with that is the kitchen has to be spotless. The, the, the people cooking have to be neat, clean, tidy organized and and just know what they're doing there's there's no room for error that means no picking your nose okay <laughs> <laughs> or, or or anybody else's we, we're, we're coming up on our hour guys uh before we before we get out and sign off i'd like to go back one more time real quick um people watching at home they've been thinking about culinary maybe they're ninth tenth grade something should they go to votech for it whatever just a little bit of uh, advice from uh, three people that took culinary in com- three complete different directions. Starting just going left to right. Tui, you first. Again, I was having a hard time hearing you. The uh, one more time to the kids at home, ninth, tenth grade. Give them a little piece of advice <laughs> before uh, before you sign off if the, if they're interested in your line of work. Get in it first and try it out somewhere. Whether it's cooking or a sandwich shop or something, you got to you got to get into the heat of it a little bit. Free vocational class at high school, something like that, then cost of money. No, you get you need to go work in a restaurant. I mean, like someone else was saying, we used to be able to do it. When I first started, people would go work for for free for a week and show their worth or whatever, or try things out. You can't do that anymore, but you got to get in a real restaurant and, and try it out and give it a little bit of time before you decide what you want to do. Great. Uh, Baba, what you got? Exactly the same thing. Um, get in there, try it out, and when you leave at night, if you don't have a great sense of satisfaction of what you did during the day, then find something else to do because you're, you're going to be a disaster to the people around you and you're going to be miserable. But if you got that passion, then what? Go for it. And find a place that might apprentice you. There, there are places. I mean, we would do it if if we were allowed, but um, you know, we don't we don't have that ability as a big company. But um, you know, get in and learn. And the best advice is keep your mouth shut, keep your eyes open. And the only two words you ever need to say in the kitchen are "Yes, chef." That's the only two words you need to know. That's it. Awesome. Exactly. Philip, come on, what you got on top of those? I'm on the same lines, you know, you get in there and do some vocational classes and then work in the field um, because you have to have a realistic expectation of what it's going to be like when you get into the real world and you got to love it, you know, it's either, you know, if you don't like the heat, then you need to get out of the kitchen because it's going to be a lot of hard work and and there's going to be heat. They get into it, they like it, they love it, they're crushing it. Excellent living. Would anybody do anything different? Nope. 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 Everyone's making a great living doing their passion. Love it. Awesome. That is going to conclude our night's show. Sounds like they're all successful at it, too. You know, I want to just take a minute and thank all you guys for coming on here. And you did a great job. You're real professionals, especially right now amidst what we're, we're going through. It wasn't hard to get a hold of you. Okay, because <laughs> nobody has anything else to do. But My, now well, Mike's, gotta get, Mike's gotta get up at six a.m., so he's home early tonight. Well, as a refri- <laughs> as a refrigeration guy, I've always had a lot of respect for people in kitchens. You know, I spent a lot of time. I've been the guy you you're crawling underneath you at eight o'clock at night working on your stuff and all that. And uh, we're definitely your of, biggest fans for yeah, sure. Yeah, we got a lot of respect for you guys, and uh, and keep up the good work. And I wish you all well with uh, all that we're. Uh, all that we're uh, faced with right now and i hope you can keep your teams together and get your teams back together and continue on with whatever your uh, goals were thanks thanks again yeah thanks a lot for thanks joining for, us tonight guys me. yes oh, absolutely guys it was a pleasure meeting